Okay, you guys are familiar with this idea of a theory of everything in physics, yeah? It's uh, we want a single theory that will describe everything, and like we don't have this. We have relativity, we have quantum, but it's like we want a single theory to explain them both and different attempts to do this. Well, today I want to show a theory of everything for linear algebra. So what I'm going to show you today and prove and give some examples of is a theorem that contains within it everything in linear algebra, right? Like this, this should be like a big cell, right? So, so first what I want to do is I want to recap a couple of things we talked about so far, but then what I'm going to say is all these different things we've been talking about are special cases of this, this much more powerful, much more general theorem that's telling us something about linear algebra. And if this theory of everything metaphor doesn't have you hooked, um, you can instead like think back to, what was it, 1999? when the first Matrix movie came out. So maybe you watched the first Matrix movie. And they, they asked this question in the film, what is the Matrix? And then they made sequels, and then they remade the film this last year, and they never answered the question in a satisfactory way. Well, today we are. We're gonna give a theorem that actually explains what a Matrix is in a really compelling way, right? So that's, that's the goal, is we're gonna have some theorem that just explains, ah, that's what a Matrix is all about, right? So, so that's what I've been up to. But let me remind us of what we've seen so far. So the first thing we saw was this sure triangulization. Triangularization. Which says if you have some matrix, some matrix A, you can represent that as U, T, U conjugate transpose, where this U is some unitary matrix, and this T is an upper triangular matrix. With your diagonal entries being your eigenvalues of A. So what is this really saying? This is saying any matrix A is really a change of base up to some orthonormal change of basis. So change of basis. And a unitary matrix is just either rotation or reflection. So you just rotate or reflect your frame of reference. And then it's really just an upper triangular matrix, right? So what it's really saying is any matrix can be thought of as up to a change of basis by an orthonormal, uh, up to some orthonormal change of basis. It's just an upper triangular matrix. And, and this was true for matrices in Uh, with complex values, right? So this is n by n matrices with complex values. We, we had this result. And we're like, that's pretty nice, but like, we want to do better than upper triangular matrices, right? So wouldn't it be nice if we could change that from upper triangular to just diagonal? And that's what the spectral theorem gave us. The spectral theorem says, in fact, you can write A as u d u conjugate transpose, where as before u is some unitary, so it's columns or some orthonormal basis, but now d is diagonal. And in fact, the diagonal entries of d are just your eigenvalues lambda 1 through lambda n, the eigenvalues of your spectral theorem, right? the eigenvalues of, of A. So that's pretty good, you're like, that's even better. But there was a, a shortcoming of the spectral theorem that this is only true if A is a normal matrix. So it's less general, it's only true when you satisfy this property that A conjugate transpose A is equal to A conjugate transpose, A, A times A conjugate transpose, right? Now that's true for a lot of matrices, symmetric or more generally Hermitian, skew symmetric or more generally skew Hermitian, unitary matrices. It's true a lot of the time, but not, not in general. Again, this is true for A being some complex matrix A, but that means you, these could be complex matrices as well, so you're getting out some complex values here. But then we show that there's a real spectral theorem, which says if you limit A to be a real value matrix, you'll also get these being real values as well, right? So, so that's what the, uh, 
the Spectra theorem was telling us. And then this last week, I showed you polar decomposition. And I think this one's just awesome. Polar decomposition says there's some deep analogy between matrices and complex numbers. Where that analogy is you can write A as, well, just as you can write, so, so here's the analogy, just as you can write you know, some complex number Z as some uh, angle E to the I theta times a radius, we have exactly a similar thing here where A is some unitary matrix U, so U is still unitary, times P where P is a positive semi-definite matrix And in fact, it's just defined to be the square root of A conjugate transpose A. Okay, let's take a second to uh, try and understand what's going on here. A conjugate transpose A is a positive semi-definite matrix as well. Since A conjugate transpose A is positive semi-definite, since this guy is positive semi-definite, we know all of the eigenvalues are going to be non-negative, and that's why we can make sense of square root, right? We can diagonalize this guy, just like up here, and we get a sense he's positive semi-definite, that this D will have real non-negative entries, and so then the square root of this is just taking the square root of the diagonal matrix, right? So that's why this makes sense, and, and so we have this way of writing A like this. Okay, but again, you know, all, all of these, here your A is, is something inside of, well, you could be over the complex numbers, or in the real case, the real numbers. So either one, I'll put F here, where F is a field that's either the complex numbers or the real numbers. Um, same thing down here, you know, this is some, some matrix of complex entries, some matrix of complex values. And, and so it's like, this is nice, but there's a few shortcomings. So one, Perhaps the most interesting of these statements requires A to be normal. So like, we don't want that restriction, that's holding us back. And two, it's only true for square matrices, right? Which is pretty small among the class of matrices. So what we wanna do is have a more general result that will have all of these as special cases, but that doesn't have some restriction like A being normal or A being square. Does that make sense? So I'm gonna give you the result right now, and then maybe I'll say a few words about why some of these are special cases. I, I maybe won't flesh out all the details, but, but you can think about how these are really being encoded in this larger one. And then I wanna prove the theorem and give an example of it. So this is called the singular value decomposition. And, and this, is, this is our theory of everything for linear algebra. This, this is going to encode inside of it all these different ways of breaking down matrices. And so, so here it is. A equals U sigma V conjugate transpose. This is for A being a matrix of any size an M by N matrix, an M by N matrix, we'll say it has complex entries, where my sigma, okay, it's something like a diagonal matrix, it is a diagonal matrix, so sigma is diagonal, but you can't just say, um, it's like, well, first let's like, first just talk about dimensions, right? Like we will have that U is unitary and that V is unitary. But like, let's just think about what our dimensions are in this example. A is an M by N. 
So it's like, well, what, what kind of dimensions here would even make sense for matrix multiplication? If I want my u and my v to be unitary, I need them to be square matrices. And, and so that's going to leave this guy in the middle to be the rectangular one. So sigma will be an m by n, whereas u will be an m by m, and sigma will be a n by n. Right? So now, now this makes sense as matrix multiplication. But like, A isn't a square matrix. So, so usually the story we tell over here is like these are the eigenvalues of A and these correspond to the eigenvectors where you go ahead and you uh, uh, find some orthonormal basis. But it's like, this story doesn't make sense if this guy isn't square. That's why he had to be square. So it's like, my problem is A isn't even square, so how am I gonna tell a story like that over here? Well, instead what I'm gonna do is I'm going to think about two matrices associated to A. One will be A conjugate transpose A, and one will be A, A conjugate transpose. Now these are both square matrices, but they have different dimensions. If A is an M by N matrix, then when you take the transpose, A conjugate transpose is an N by M matrix. So this guy here becomes an N by N matrix. Whereas if we look at A times A conjugate transpose, we have an M by N times an N by M. So this is an M by M matrix. In fact, it's not just that these matrices are square. What else is true of them? Well, what's true of like this guy? What does this form remind you of? We just had a discussion like that. Matrices like this are positive semi indefinite. This guy right here is a positive semi definite matrix. And not just this one, so is this one. Because you can think, well, instead of making your matrix be A, this is A conjugate transpose, conjugate transpose times A conjugate transpose, right? So, so by, by just doing a conjugate transpose, we have these are both positive semi-definite matrices. So since these are positive semi-definite matrices, they have real eigenvalues, real non-negative eigenvalues. And in fact, you can then argue, since this guy has real non-negative eigenvalues, and this guy has real non-negative eigenvalues, those eigenvalues are the same. So what this diagonal guy here is going to be is this I'm just going to take to be, well, I want to say, I want to say it's like the eigenvalues of this, but that's not quite right. You might think, uh, well, this, you know, if, if A is something nice, like where A equals is something like self-adjoint, where A equals its conjugate transpose, this is just like squaring A, right? This is some analogy of squaring A for rectangular matrices. And so instead of, instead of making my sigma just be the eigenvalues of this guy, I'll make it the square root this would be the square roots of the eigenvalues of A conjugate transpose A. Since we know these eigenvalues are real, non-negative, we can take the square roots of them, and that gives you the, the diagonal entries of sigma. Or you could do the same thing with A, A conjugate transpose. It doesn't matter which one you pick. Doesn't matter. Okay. Then when you come to U being unitary, it's like, okay, how, how am I going to get a unitary guy? Well, I have right here two square matrices, and I'm finding the eigenvalues of them, and so I should just look at the corresponding eigenvectors. Although, let's make sure we get our sizes right. U is the M by M guy, which is this guy on bottom. So if I just take the eigenvectors of him, of A, A conjugate transpose, and make sure I normalize them so they're orthogonal to each other, then I get an orthonormal basis, so I, this is gonna be the eigenvectors of, of A, A conjugate transpose. That will give you an M by M matrix. And if I want an N by N matrix, my N by N matrix is just A conjugate transpose A, and so this is just going to be 
the eigenvectors of a conjugate transpose A. Okay, so there are two things I want to do. I want to prove this, and I want to maybe say a few words about why it reduces into this special case. Maybe we should do the proof first. I think the proof helps us better understand what's going on here. So any rectangular matrix can be written as some unitary matrix times something that corresponds to a diagonal matrix, except instead of being the eigenvalues of A, it's the square roots of the eigenvalues of A conjugate transpose A, and then another unitary matrix, right? So let's try and understand what's going on here. Okay. Well, the first thing I have is if I think about, um, well, okay. There, there's gonna be two cases and it's going to depend upon um, if my M is bigger than my N or if my N is bigger than my M. So, so we can break this up into two cases. Um, let me just do the one case of supposing that your M is at least as large as your N. Um, you can do an exactly analogous argument if it's the case that N is larger, but, but let's just, with that loss of generality, consider this case. Everything occurs the same, you just have to flip some stuff around in the argument. And I want to think about the matrix A conjugate transpose A. We've already said that this matrix is positive semi-definite. I was already getting into this a second ago. So since it's positive semi-definite, I can write it as some unitary matrix, uh, sure, we'll use U, times some diagonal matrix times some U conjugate transpose. Where your diagonal matrix is real with non-negative entries, right? That's what we were just alluding to a second ago. Okay, so since your diagonal entry is real with non with non-zero entries, I can define sigma to be the square root of D. That is this is now just U sigma sigma U conjugate transpose. But since D has non-negative entries, sigma also now has zero, uh, real non-negative entries. And it's a diagonal matrix, which means if I take the transpose of it, it stays the same. And since the entries are real, if I take the conj complex conjugate, its entries are the same. Hence, sigma conjugate transpose is just sigma, right? Taking the complex conjugate doesn't change anything because the entries are real. Taking the transpose doesn't change anything because it's diagonal. So I can just change one of these sigmas into the complex conjugate of sigma. This is just U sigma complex conjugate times sigma U complex conjugate. And why would I do that? Well, I do that because now when I look at this, I see, oh, this is secretly just U sigma complex conjugate times U sigma complex conjugate, complex conjugate. That is, I have some matrix times its complex conjugate. Now let's think back to last week. I have some matrix times its complex conjugate. I have some other matrix times its complex conjugate, right? And I'm claiming that, well, they're equal to each other. So matrix times complex conjugate, so matrix times complex conjugate. Therefore, by the, remember this? Unitary freedom of positive semi-definite decompositions, these guys are the same. These matrices are the same up to some unitary matrix. So I have that A is the same as U sigma uh, um, complex conjugate 
up to multiplication by some unitary matrix. And so, you know, I can just call that unitary matrix something like V, and then that just gives me that my A is U sigma complex conjugate V complex conjugate, but that complex conjugate is nothing to the sigma, so I recover the formula I was looking for. Okay, so like this came really quickly. What I need to do with the proofs going comprised of now is showing that that guy actually satisfies all the properties that I wanted to satisfy. But I don't think that's too hard. So, I mean, we've already seen here that A conjugate transpose A is just the multiplication by these guys. So, so let's, just, let's just do this out. So in particular, thus, what happens when you have A conjugate transpose A? Well, it's just going to be this guy, U sigma V conjugate transpose times uh, conjugate transpose times himself, U sigma V conjugate transpose. So what is that? Um, the V comes over here, it's just V. This is sigma conjugate transpose, but that doesn't really do anything because this is a real non-negative entries. Um, U becomes U conjugate transpose. U sigma V conjugate transpose. So this is just V times U transpose transpose U. That is just identity matrix, right? Because these are unitary, so that's just the identity. So you just have sigma times sigma. But sigma times sigma, we said, is your D, your diagonal matrix, times V conjugate transpose. <clears throat> so like, what does that tell you? Well, that says that it, you can decompose this as V, D, V conjugate transpose, where D is your eigenvalues. Therefore, what must V be? By your spectral theorem, V is just the eigenvectors of A conjugate transpose A. An orthonormal basis comprising eigenvectors. And then you just do the exact same multiplication on the other direction. What is A times A conjugate transpose? Well, A is U sigma V conjugate transpose times its conjugate transpose, U sigma V conjugate transpose, conjugate transpose. What do we get? U sigma V conjugate transpose, and then conjugate transpose of this guy on the right is V sigma conjugate transpose, but that doesn't do anything. U conjugate transpose, that V conjugate transpose V is just identity because the unitary matrices. And so you have just U D U conjugate transpose, but then by the spectral theorem you have, okay, so that U is really just the eigenvectors of this guy, A, A conjugate transpose. So, so it's really, these properties are really baked into this definition. Okay, so, so this was not hard to prove. I mean, it, it's just lifting up these previous cases to a more general setting. And so maybe it's like immediately obvious that this is like generalizing these other settings. But, but let's just like talk about it for a second. Why should you really believe this is a generalization? I mean, we kind of saw it in the proof, we're using these as our tools, but let's just think about a couple of these. Um, let's talk about the spectral theorem. So what would happen in this theorem if A happened to be square and normal? Let's see what that would be telling us. So, Let's, let's, let's apply the singular value decomposition, but to a setting where A is square and normal. Okay. Well, that would mean that my A conjugate transpose A equals A a conjugate transpose. So these are actually the same matrix. 
So when I go and I calculate my u and my v by finding the eigenvectors of this guy and the eigenvectors of this guy, well, these are the same matrix. And so this actually gives you then that the issue of u is your v. Thus, you would have that you could write A as some U times some sigma times some U conjugate transpose, right? Okay, now let's like think about what sigma is saying. We wanna show that your sigma really is just D, really is just your eigenvalues of, of A. So one way to think about this is that, okay, we also have that A is U, D, U conjugate transpose. Like we wanna figure out what's the relationship between sigma and D. My D is just some collection of eigenvalues. And the problem is, these may not be things that are real um, non-negative. Your eigenvalues may be complex. So my eigenvalues a priori might be something like some radius times e to the i times some angle down through some radius times e to the i times some angle. Right? Like if these are just eigenvalues of some complex matrix, they may, they may look something like this. Where your r is your real part, but then you have some you know, uh, unit valued complex guides giving you a direction, right? Like this might be I, like one times I or something, right? So, so this might be where your D looks like. Where a sigma up here isn't supposed to look like that, you want your sigma to really be looking like, okay, so, so maybe this is a little bit bad because um, uh, these unitary matrices like, you both have unitary matrices here and here, but it's like you have different, you know, this, this guy here, you just want to be, you just want to be um, some sigma one through some sigma n, where you want all of these sigmas to be real. You want all of these sigmas to be some real non-negative value, right? Uh, I won't use i, because I don't confuse you with the comp uh, imaginary unit. So you might be like, okay, this is actually saying something different over here than you have over here. So that's your concern. But I, I want to say, don't, that shouldn't be a concern, because you can just write d as R1 through Rn times e to the i theta one through e to the i theta n. That is, it's just some matrix representing your real value radii times some matrix representing whatever the complex part of the number is. So you can write D like this. Then, once you have that, you have that your A is really just equal to some unitary matrix U times R times theta times U conjugate transpose. But this then is just identical to U times R times U theta conjugate transpose, conjugate transpose. Note, theta is unitary, right? It's diagonal, so all of these guys are, are orthogonal to each other, but also each of these guys has unit length, right? This is just um, the, the complex part of unit length. So theta is unitary, so the product of U with theta conjugate transpose is unitary, so this is a unitary matrix. This becomes a unitary matrix V. And R is just the real part of those eigenvalues, which is exactly where your sigmas are if you think about it. So, so these are actually both saying the exact same thing. It's just the, uh, by insisting that these are real non-negative entries, you move something over here, changing this unitary matrix from U conjugate transpose to a different unitary matrix but they're equivalent. The statement of the singular value decomposition is just generalizing your spectral theorem. 
And, and this one, maybe this one's even quicker to see. Like, like this one's super fast to see. Like why is A equal to this? Well, like we, we claim instead, like why does the polar decomposition fall out of this? We're saying that A is U times sigma times V conjugate transpose. Well, I say just go ahead and cluster these two together. It's like U is your unity matrix, good. What is this guy? Well, notice, like, what is sigma V times uh, a conjugate transpose times itself? Sigma V conjugate transpose. That just comes out to be V, and then sigma times sigma is your D times V conjugate transpose, which is exactly where we said A, which one was that? That was A, uh, what is it when you have this with Vs? That's A conjugate transpose A, right? That's, that's just what A conjugate transpose A is. That's just A conjugate transpose A. So this guy here really is, just like here, the square root of A conjugate transpose A. Okay, so polar decomposition just falls out immediately. Okay, uh, enough of that. This is the theorem we're gonna talk about. All of these guys are just like packed into this. This is one big statement that, that, gen so that, that summarizes everything we've covered so far. So, so I think what we should do to wrap up today is look at an example of this, right? Like, like what is this really saying? And, and what is like the picture you should have in your mind? And so I think I'll wrap up today with with a nice example of this. Okay, um, as I'm you know, cleaning some space, do you have any questions so far? Is it clear what the theorem's saying? Okay, uh, I think what I really wanna give you, you know, like before, before to the end of like today's class is like a picture of what this is saying about matrices. And, and I think what happens is if we, if we do a quick example, I'll be able to draw a picture and it'll, it'll help much more you see like what this is really claiming. So, so here's my example. Let's consider some matrix. Um, I did this out last night just to make sure I don't make any mistakes. So I'll, I'll keep it in front of me. Uh, three, minus two, minus two, zero. Let's make this our matrix. Okay, so um, the first thing we can do is we can calculate A conjugate transpose A. This is going to come out to be, uh, conjugate transpose doesn't change this, this is symmetric. So this matrix remains the same. Uh, let, me, let me change this to positive two. That makes it a little more interesting. So the conjugate transpose makes the negative come up top now, and then A leaves the negative on bottom. And so this is just the matrix um, 13, six, six, and four, right? Okay. The first thing we can do is we can find the eigenvalues of this. And, and the claim is that since we, we made this, since we did A conjugate transpose A, this is positive semi-definite. So we should expect eigenvalues that are real, not negative. And sure enough, if you calculate the eigenvalues of this, if you like, what are the eigenvalues? Well, let me just tell you, your eigenvalues come out to be uh, one and 16. So you can just calculate it. Once you have your eigenvalues, to figure out sigma, we actually want the square root of those eigenvalues. So we can do the square root since they're not negative. So they come out to be one and four. So now we know what our matrix sigma is going to be. It's one and four on the diagonal. Now we want to figure out our matrices U and V. So um, remember V are just the eigenvectors of this guy. So we want to find his eigenvectors. So we want to solve, you know, like when, when do we have this minus one copy of identity giving you, giving you zero. So you just solve that. So subtract off one copy of the identity. So you get 12, six, six, three. So what should your V1 be to get zero? Well, I guess something like one negative two would do the trick, yeah? 
And then if I come over and I want to find my second eigenvector, that's going to correspond to 16. So I have A conjugate transpose A minus 16 times the identity times your second eigenvector will be 0. So that will be negative 3, 6, 6, negative 12. So what should this vector be? What, what can go in here? Two, one. Yeah, 2, 1 works, right? 2, 1. OK, of course, you should make those unit vectors. But now we see that my, my matrix sigma is just going to be the matrix 1, 0, 0, 4. And my matrix V is just going to be, well, I need to make these unit. So the length of both of those is uh, root 5. So I need to divide everything by root 5. So I have an orthonormal basis. But then it's just 1 minus 2 and 2, 1. OK, now we want to find u. One way to find u would be to calculate a, a conjugate transpose and find the eigenvectors of that. The eigenvalues would be the same. You can do it. See, the eigenvalues are still 1 and 16. But instead of doing it that way, I can just use my theorem. My theorem tells me that A, let me bring the V over, V is U sigma. And I now know A, V, and sigma, so we can solve for U. Right? So, well, we will be able to solve for U because U sigma comes out to be really, really quite nice. Let's just think really fast. A is the matrix 3, minus 2, 2, 0. V is the matrix 1 over root 5 times 1 minus 2, 2, 1. And then what happens when you have u sigma? Well, u is something like you know, u1, 1, 1, u1, 2, u1, 3, uh, u2, uh, 1, u2, 2. two times sigma, sigma is just sigma 1, sigma 2 along the diagonal. And if you think about what happens when you do row times column, row times column, multiplying by a diagonal matrix, it's just scaling the first column by sigma 1 and scaling the second column by sigma 2. So this will come out to equal exactly the first column is just whatever you, u1, you know, it's, it's your first column, the first column scaled by a sigma 1. And then it's the second column scaled by a sigma 2. And I know what my sigma 1 and my sigma 2 are. They're 1 and 4. So that's just 1 times u1 and 4 times u2. So I just need to calculate this out. And then I divide the first column by 1 and the second column by 4. And I get what my u is. So a much faster way to calculate u. So this just comes out to be row times column 3 minus 4, row times column 6 minus 2, row times column negative 2, row times column negative 4. Did I do that correctly? I think so. 1 over root 5. And so my matrix u is just the matrix where it's, well, I still have the 1 over root 5. The first column is just the first column, but the second column needs to be scaled by a factor of 4. Something went wrong. That's not orthonormal. So what I do wrong here, rho times column is um, 6 plus two, 1. That's 8. So that's 2. OK. Now it's orthonormal. So like, that's a quick check. Like Your answer should be an orthonormal matrix. OK, and let me check if that's what I got when I did last night. Um, yes, my u came out to be exactly that. So what do we have then? What this theorem is claiming is that my matrix A, which was the matrix 3, minus 2, 2, 0, is just exactly equal to first the matrix u, 1 over root 5 times 1 
2 minus 2, 1 times the matrix sigma, which is 1, 0, 0, 4, times V conjugate transpose, which is just going to be the transpose since this is real. So 1 over root 5 times 1 minus 2, 2, 1. Okay, this is my U, this is my V conjugate transpose. This is sigma, this is A. Does everything look good? Did all the math work out? You check in my steps, it seems good? It'd be bad if we made a mistake. But like, what's the story this is telling you? So. So I want to draw a picture to tell you the story. So one way to think about the story here is it's if I want to go and perform the move corresponding to the matrix A, I could just do A. So A is just going to be sending the vector 0, 1 to 3 minus 2. So 3 minus 2 is something big like this. And setting the matrix 1, 0 to the matrix 2, 0 to something like this, you know? Some matrix like that. So that's what A does. Sends your first elementary vector here and a second one here. But it's like, that's not giving you a picture of what the transformation is doing. It's like, what is that transformation doing? Like trying to express it with your hand. It's not quite clear. So what you have instead is you have another story of what the transformation does. Remember matrix multiplication, you do this one, this one, this one. You have some vector, you'd apply this first, then this one, then this one. So instead of this story, you should instead think what's happening is first I'm doing V conjugate transpose to, to, to move up here. And then I'm going to be doing a sigma to move over, and then I'm going to be doing a U to come down. And this is a much more compelling story. So what is V conjugate transpose? Well, it's this guy. We can keep track of what it does to these particular vectors. So like uh, zero, uh, one zero just goes to one two. So he looks something like him. And 0, uh, 1 goes to negative 2, 1, something like him. It's, they should still be orthogonal to each other because it's orthonormal, right? But what you should really think is going on is if you look at the unit circle, what V conjugate transpose does is just a rotation. So, so this, is just, this is just some rotation. V would be rotating this way, V conjugate transpose that way. Unitary matrices are always just either rotations or reflections. Here it's just a rotation. You just rotate. And then what is sigma? Well, sigma is just 1, 4. So sigma is just going to stretch. You're going to stretch 1 in the x direction, so you're going to stay the same, and 4 in the y direction. So your circle is just going to become a nice long oval. Where in, in one direction, you stay the same length. In one direction, you stay the same length times 1. But in the other direction, there was like a times four stretching. So your circle becomes an oval. And you know, when that stretches, this blue guy will end up going somewhere up here. And this red guy goes somewhere over here. But then what is, what is U doing? Well, U is the guy that takes you know, these two unit vectors, this guy and this guy. It takes these two unit vectors and takes uh, the first one down to 1, negative 2. So 1 comes like down here. And the second one goes to 2, 1, somewhere up there. It takes those two and it moves it. So, so all U is, oh, did I do that right? Ah, I mixed up the colors, didn't I? The first one was green. The second one was yellow. So really all U is doing is U is just rotating you down. 
U is just rotating like this. It's rotating him down. But instead of keeping track of the circle that gets rotated, you could. There's a circle here that just got rotated. Instead, you can just think the oval is getting rotated. So that oval just gets rotated to the right, and so it ends up looking something like, oh, it's, it's a pretty serious rotation. One, negative two, two, one. He ends up down here. So what does that oval end up looking like? It's, right, it's, it's something like uh, green is going in the direction of the short end, yellow is more of the long end. Something, something like this. You have a, a rotation of the oval, right? So what the theorem is saying, the single value composition, is that all a matrix does is a rotation or reflection, rotate, stretch, rotate. That's what every matrix does, or reflex. Rotate, stretch in some direction, rotate. That's it, that's a matrix. So this should have been in the movie, right? You know, rotate, some kind of stretching, and rotating back. That's the matrix. That's what a matrix is. That's what we've proven. We'll stop there. <laughs>